couple of really nice questions have come in about the soundscape. The first one is, listening and watching is relaxing and rather hypnotic, especially on a lovely warm still day. But I was occasionally jolted by a sharp sound, like an acorn fired into the back of my head. What's that sound? In the field recording, you can hear the louder raindrops that fall close to the microphones, as well as the really faint, quiet raindrops, which are really small or really far away from the microphones. All of the raindrops are vibrating with the sandy earth of the forest floor. But every now and then, a raindrop will get so close to the microphones that it'll actually hit them. And that creates that much sharper, louder pop. Another person asked about the very low frequencies that you can hear on the sound recording and asked what produces that sound in the forest floor. I like this question because it responds to the shift in perspective from hearing a rainstorm from above the ground to below the ground. When you're in a rainstorm in a forest normally listening to it from a human perspective, which is hearing the rain bounce off the leaves of the trees. And those frequencies are normally a bit higher. But when you're listening to the rainstorm from beneath the ground, there's so much more surface area for the sound to vibrate within. And perhaps that's what produces these low tones. Another person's asked, how does the cyanotype process work? I initially made drawings from the spectrogram of the four different decibel ranges of the soundscape. These drawings were then printed out onto clear acetate, so wherever I'd drawn or made a mark, the ink was opaque, whereas the acetate was still clear. I painted a light-sensitive cyanotype emulsion onto paper and let that dry in the dark. When that was fully dry, I could lay my acetate with the drawing on it on top of the dry emulsion, which had soaked into the paper. This was then exposed to UV light. Wherever the light passed through the clear acetate, it hardened the emulsion, turning it blue. Wherever there was ink, opaque ink, the light was blocked, the emulsion stayed soft and then could be washed away with water. So those areas were left white. There was a comment and a question about the ropes that attach the banners to the trees and the ground and the way those black ropes interrupt the aesthetics of looking at the banners. And this person found that a little bit jarring and they asked, is that jarring effect, a comment on the anthropocentric view that we normally have of nature, the way we impose ourselves upon it. Throughout the different trials of installing forest listening, we went through about three different types of rope, each time trying to choose something a little less noticeable, a little thinner, a little easier to tie so that it would hide away. So although it's a really nice suggestion that I had intended this jarring aesthetic to be a comment within the artwork, my intention was in fact to attempt to choose ropes that were less visible and didn't draw the eye. Hopefully with the installation in Limnuslis at the Watts Artist Village, we have chosen a rope that doesn't draw the eye quite so much. There's a question about the installation process and the different woodlands that forest listing has been installed. It asks how each woodland and the surrounding soundscape of that woodland determines the placement of the banners. In each location that forest listing has been installed, the woodland and its surrounding soundscape makes a huge difference. Things I always consider are, is it safe to hang the banners in this location? Is it safe for the trees? Is it safe for the public? How can the work be hung so that when it's taken down, you wouldn't even notice it had been there? What's the formation of the woodland? And does that mean the banners are going to be all hung together in a cluster or spread really far apart? My intention is that the artwork will always blend with the woodland environment and never just use it like a plinth. 
At times it's been really nice to have the rain soundscape play from speakers so that it blends with the forest soundscape in that location. And sometimes it's really nice to be able to provide a really immersive personal experience through headphones. For example, there might be a really busy road nearby or chainsawing going on in the forest that day. It's often quite difficult to control these outside factors and in these scenarios it's better that the soundscape is heard through headphones. The next question is a huge one. What place do you think trees, forests and woodlands have in the art world today? I think there's a lot of appetite and interest in the art world at the moment for work that thinks about trees and forests. The most recent example of which is the exhibition at the Haywood Gallery, Among the Trees. For me, the artwork that most successfully explores trees and forests is a work that delves deeper and doesn't just consider the surface visual aesthetics. Forests are a multi-sensory experience. They're not just the visual aesthetics. They're the sounds, the smells, the feel of the wind and the rain, the temperature. And the artwork about trees and forests that I'm most curious about considers more than just the visual aesthetics and thinks about some of these other multi-sensory aspects of forests. This is a lovely question. What first inspired you to work in forest settings? I admit that it was actually a longing or a a yearning to be back in a woodland environment. I grew up surrounded by trees, camping, climbing trees, running around my granddad's tree nursery. And now I live in a third floor flat in central London and I feel the loss of those environments. This project is part of my attempt to reattune myself to forest environments so that I might be able to learn from them and identify the ecological degradation and loss that's occurring at the moment due to climate breakdown. This is an uplifting question. What is my favourite sound? My favourite sound is always the soundscape that I'm about to work on next. The next soundscape that I'll be working on was recorded inside a forest puddle. So although you can hear a muffled train in the distance or a plane going overhead, you're protected from them inside this watery world of clicks and fizzes and pops. So at the moment, that's my favourite sound. And the question that I'll finish on is, if you could listen to any forest or natural landscape in the world, where would it be? My answer is a really simple one. One day I'd really like to go to the Californian redwoods and listen to the salty mist settle in the pine needles as it's blown in from the sea.